Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today's three stories focus on the fine line between heroes and villains. Uh, and what's more, our first two stories actually revolve around rumors on two hot upcoming properties. So the first is actually a rumor that's beginning to gain some traction online and was brought to my attention yesterday by BTT viewer uh, Punk and Girly Love. And Punk and Girly Love said, Grace! You have got to check out this new rumor that's uh, starting to circulate about The Incredibles 2. So I was like, ooh, I want to know more about The Incredibles 2. So I, uh, I quickly turned to the depths of the internet, and this is what I unearthed. So apparently the rumor is, is that uh, they will do a fast forward in terms of time for The Incredibles 2. Uh, and this is just a rumor, so I don't know if it constitutes a spoiler, but if you don't want any potential spoilers whatsoever, although I think this is a situation which would have to be divulged in the trailer because it would be the whole setup for the film, but uh, just be aware that today's whole episode is, uh, is slightly in spoiler territory. Uh, so anyway, the rumor is, is that this takes place in the future where uh, Bob and Helen Parr, Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, have retired and their children have taken over their crime-fighting mantle. Uh, however, their youngest son, Jack-Jack, uh, because he can't control his powers, has become a villain. And I think that is, of course, a story as old as time when it comes to comic books, but one that hasn't been explored very much in uh, the movies and pop, more popular mediums, uh, especially, again, the movies. I think TV might have, uh, you know, delved into it a little bit, particularly in animation, but I think live action movies haven't really covered this, especially to the depths that Pixar is willing to go. I mean, thank goodness this isn't a Marvel movie because, as Kevin Feige has said, they won't go dark. And I think if you're going to do this story justice, uh, if you're going to have the youngest incredible son turn evil, uh, you know, because he's lost to his own abilities, you have to really go for it. And I think that we all know that Brad Bird will be willing to go for it, uh, especially as, as, dark, he, as uh, dark as he potentially got in Tomorrowland. That didn't really work out, but David Lindelof was in there messing that up. So hopefully when Brad Bird is left to his own devices uh, and, you know, interfaces with the Pixar story team, he can come up with something a little bit stronger. Also, as you all know, I don't like Pixar for their emotional manipulation, but I think that it comes in handy with a storyline like this because I think the suits at Pixar would be all over this. They'd be like, this is exactly our M.O. This is going to be amazing. We're going to make people cry multiple times. Uh, and so I'm, I think this is a, actually a very good idea. And I, what I like about it is that even though it's a little bit of a traditional storyline, I think that Brad Bird can offer some excellent commentary and a different perspective on it, just like he did with the first Incredibles. You know, he really made a huge difference on the genre, as I discussed in my recent coverage of the, of the Incredibles 2 and what might potentially be in store for the film. But as you might recall, he single-handedly got rid of capes. No one wears a cape anymore, really, except for Superman, who, you know, kind of has to. Uh, it's so iconic to his, uh, his, um, his costume. And also Wonder Woman, apparently, is getting a cape, but I don't know how much she'll wear it in battle. We do see her actually having it uh, on in one of the scenes in the trailer even already. Uh, but she, he basically got rid of capes and also monologuing. He really brought it to everyone's attention, uh, you know, what we always kind of knew in the back of our minds that uh, villains like to talk a little bit too long, but he also gave it a term. So I think that, you know, what Brad Bird accomplished with The Incredibles was impressive, both in terms of entertainment value, uh, you know, cre creative accomplishment, box office accomplishment, and also commentary on the superhero genre. And I think this is an interesting way for him to delve into that even further. And also to, you know, tackle villains once again without having to do a syndrome type story. I mean, he already did the sidekick turned evil or potential sidekick turned evil. Uh, I think this could be really great. And also Jack-Jack, as we all know from the, uh, the end of the movie, has some really cool powers. So I think that him being lost to those powers and using them for evil could make for some really fantastic uh, action sequences. So this is a theory that I think is fantastic. Now, it reminds me a little bit of one animated short, uh, of course, from DC, that went super dark, or not animated short, animated film, and that is Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, which to this day is one of the most disturbing and fantastic, uh, you know, additions to Batman lore ever created. Uh, now, if you've never seen that, I'll put a link to uh, some of the sequences down below that are available on YouTube. Uh, but this is the second story of the day, and it ties into a little rumor that's just stating about the new DC Cinematic Universe. And this has to do, of course, with the Joker. Now, uh, in, the, in the Batman Beyond Return of the Joker storyline, 
uh, um, Tim Drake was kidnapped by the Joker and Harley Quinn who wanted to have a child. But they didn't want to, you know, as, they, as Harley Quinn says, go through a messy childbirth and no one would let them adopt. So then uh, a, a great line from the Joker. And then we remember to Batman, you always have a couple running around. So they took Tim Drake and they brainwashed him and turned him into a mini Joker. Incredibly disturbing. I'm not doing it justice in my description. Very well written, very well animated, very well acted in terms of the voice acting. And on that note, Joker's getting a lot of playtime because it was just announced that Mark Hamill is returning to the world once again to do the voice for the character. Actually, rumors he's already, he's already recorded it for the animated version of The Killing Joke. Uh, I, I question whether or not DC wants to continue to associate Mark Hamill so strongly with the character, though, when Jared Leto is trying to take it over. Uh, but anyway, wonderful storyline. Now, this, there, this all leads to a rumor that has been going on for the past couple of weeks that some of you have asked me about. I've had multiple people ask me about it, so I thought today was a good day to discuss it because it fits in with all the other stories we're doing. And this is that Jason Todd is the Joker. That Jared Leto is playing Jason Todd, who has turned himself into the Joker. Maybe he ended up killing the Joker. Who knows how he ended up taking on that position, but uh, that is who Batman is fighting and who turns Harley Quinn. Uh, I have big problems with this theory. As much as I like the Jack-Jack theory, I dislike the Jason Todd is Joker theory. Now, and here's why. Well, first of all, um, they're saying that, you know, one spoiler for the movie is that it's been revealed there's the tombstone for uh, Richard Grayson, Dick Grayson, the original Robin. Uh, and so my feeling, though, is they've just consolidated the Robins. They've just made them all just one because I think that in the mainstream, uh, to the mainstream audience, you know, there's never really been more than one Robin to, to that group. Uh, and I think that you don't want to spend too much time trying to establish backstory. Like, which Robin is dead? Oh, well, that's the second Robin. The first Robin's right over there. And I have a third Robin. And yeah, I'm considering a fourth Robin. I think, you know, a lot of mainstream viewers would be like, too many Robins. Uh, so I think that my guess would be is that that's who uh, the Joker killed. He killed Dick Grayson. Just to consolidate it and make it a little bit easier because they already have enough characters on screen, right? But the theory is, is that this is Jason Todd. Uh, and the reason is because in the comics, uh, Jason Todd, took, Todd eventually came back, was resurrected by uh, 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 Talia in the, in the Lazarus pits, and he became the Red Hood. And the Red Hood, of course, was the Joker's original criminal identity. Uh, he wasn't very good at it, but that's the identity he, costume he was wearing when he went into that uh, Ace Chemicals uh, vat uh, and became the Joker and the Batman's greatest nemesis. So I can see where the theory is coming from, but I think that it's just a little bit too meta, and I think also it makes everything circle a little bit too strongly back to Batman. Uh, I like the mystery around the Joker, that he's this unstoppable force, that he's someone who had horrible things that happened to him, uh, we think, because the Joker's background story is never really firmly established. But while well, Batman went one way, the Joker went the other way. And I do like that they do a dance of madness. That's been explored a lot, particularly recently, uh, in the comics with Grant Morrison and Scott Snyder, that they're two different different uh, sides of the same coin of, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, tremendous loss and what it does to your psyche. And that's even actually explored in The Killing Joke uh, as written by Alan Moore. Fantastic comic. I really recommend you read it. It's crucial reading for The Joker, although it's for adults only. Uh, definitely a rated R comic. Uh, but anyway, I think that I like them being equals, not that Batman created the Joker. I mean, I think some people like to argue that, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Batman or his costume villains, right? Did he actually inspire that madness? And Batman Earth One, by the way, written by Jeff Johns, that I promote every chance I get, it does a wonderful job of, you know, putting a seed in the Wayne bloodline for where that, or at least for Bruce Wayne, where that insanity or potential insanity might come from, which I think is spectacular. Great choice. Uh, but I just feel that that seems like an organic change to me. Well, this one seems like, uh, you know, a screenwriter being like, you know, it would be cool and not really, I think, and, and disregarding and disrespecting decades of comic book lore. I wouldn't change it. I think there are enough changes going on with this Joker. Uh, some people have said this is why he has all those tattoos on, but I think that's more of David Ayer trying to reflect today's current criminal culture uh, and the way that most criminals look. Uh, and I think that that does make sense. And I much prefer that
that uh, the Joker has a Robin tattoo on his arm uh, as, you know, almost like, you know, a notch on a belt, like, got one, uh, then rather, you know, a, a nod to his former identity. So I'm curious, what do you think of that theory? Is that something you'd like to see? Uh, and what do you think of factoring the Joker so strongly into Batman? Uh, you know, not in terms of their, their relationship going forward, but in their, their past. Also, when he dresses up, you know, there's uh, some thoughts that he's one in the Batman mask in the Suicide Squad trailer. I just think that if he used to be the former Batman in training, it's just a little too on the nose. And it maybe, you know, offers a chance for redemption. The Joker shouldn't be able to be redeemed. He should be, he should be, he is what he, he is what he is. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, I said this was a whole episode about uh, heroes and villains, and Gambit is a character that has always walked that fine line. Uh, started out as a thief in New Orleans, a member of the Thieves Guild. They have a warring uh, relationship, you know, almost like the Montagues and the Capulets in Romeo and Juliet with the Assassin's Guild. Uh, and we, I think we've all for some time believed that that's what's going to be depicted in the upcoming Gambit film starring Channing Tatum. And the reason that's in the news today is that they're going to start shooting in October, and there were some headlines yesterday that the state has divulged the budget for the film. Uh, also some casting notices. So the first thing with the casting notices is that it calls for criminal types. So that just further adds credence to the idea that it's going to be Thieves Guild versus Assassin's Guild, which I think is fantastic. I think that's a really great part of the Gambit uh, backstory, and of course, uh, leads to some great sequences for this movie. Uh, now, the thing is, the budget's pegged at $154 million. Now, again, that's the state's number, and they're saying they expect most of that to be spent in Louisiana. Uh, and, now, unless Channing Tatum has a Louisiana address that we don't know about, I think that's unlikely, because that would mean the budget would be even higher. And on that note, I do hope that the budget is mostly visual effects work and be going to be poured onto the screen instead of into Channing Tatum's pocket. Uh, but anyway, I'm very excited about this film. I think that Gambit could be a great character. I think Channing Tatum is a great choice to play him. However, in light of Ant-Man, I think that there are some red potential red flags going up here, and that this might also be a small story. You know, Scott Lang, also a thief, uh, that doesn't really, you know, entice audiences to go to the theater. It's almost the exact same setup as the Ant-Man movie, right? When you think about it, uh, smaller in scope, not tied into any large crossovers. Uh, and while the Wolverine films did very well, that's because Hugh Jackman was such a big part at first of the standalone movies. And I think Hugh Jackman, at least as Wolverine, has a lot of star power. I think he's a big draw at the box office as that character. So what you really have here is a, you know, um, a, ch uh, a challenge of star power, right? Is, does Channing Tatum have more star power than Paul Rudd? Because Paul Rudd didn't have enough to quite get Ant-Man off the ground to the degree that Marvel needed it to get off the ground. It's still doing solid business. I, mean, I think none of, no one wants to write it off yet, not only because there's no need to, but because we're all rooting for it, those of us who really enjoyed the film. But I still, I still hear people that I run into, uh, you know, especially, you know, outside of the internet, who didn't like Ant-Man and said they thought it was boring. So I was like, what? Oh, man, poor Ant-Man. But I do feel like there might be a potential similar problem going on with Gambit that, again, too small, not tied in enough to the, the big event pictures. Because there are so many comic book movies these days that people might start making uh, you know, choices as to what they want to see on the big screen and what they don't, and scope might be one of the deciding factors. All right, so those are the three stories of the day, our Heroes and Villains episode. And then on to the viewer question, which kind of ties in a little bit to the introducing new characters. Well, it actually directly does, but it, uh, the question... Oh, let me just read you the question. All right, so it's from the UK Dark Knight. And the UK Dark Knight says, Hi Grace, greetings from England. Awesome, hello, across the pond. Uh, my question is, do you think that the DCCU could catch up on the success that the MCU has gained now that they are competing for box office success? And do you think that the DCCU is feeling a bit rushed and overfilled compared to Marvel's slow introduction to its characters? Uh, so basically the UK Dark Knight wants to know if DC might potentially catch up or if maybe they're a little bit too uh, rushed in the process to really have any financial success. But then the UK Dark Knight continues saying, uh, thanks for the amazing episodes. Uh, I watch BCT every day and keep up the good work. Smiley face. Oh, well, thank you, the UK Dark Knight. That is very much appreciated. And thank you for asking such a great question. So I think that the question, of, uh, I really want to focus here, I, I think in terms of catching up, I don't know. I feel that Marvel is tripping themselves up a little bit. That episode is coming this week. It is a huge edit. That's why it's been a little bit delayed. It's been shot. Uh, but anyway, uh, I feel that DC, the DCCU is gaining on Marvel, and I think it's going to make huge leaps ahead in 2016, especially if those two films are good. You know, I think that no matter what, they're going to do pretty darn big box office, but they could just really go to, to like Marvel levels and Dark Knight levels if they bring the quality as well as the shock and awe. 
Uh, so anyway, what I want to focus on here with the UK Dark Knights question is introducing new characters. And, you know, they're introducing a ton of new character over, characters over in the DCCU, and now Marvel's trying to introduce additional characters now with Ant-Man. And again, not the box office hit that Marvel was really used to getting at this point. Certainly not what happened with Guardians of the Galaxy. So I wonder if either company can really continue to introduce so many new characters. And we're beginning so many new characters over in Star Wars. Uh, just a lot of new characters all around. And then Fox is expanding its, Mar its Marvel Universe with Deadpool, which is introducing more new characters. And you might have a situation where the mainstream audience just reaches a breaking point. Uh, and also, when you're introducing so many new characters, the fan favorite characters aren't getting the attention that perhaps uh, audiences and mainstream audiences in particular like to see them uh, receive. Like, for instance, so much effort's been put on Ant-Man, but, you know, you just introduced Scarlet Witch, Kit, uh, uh, Quicksilver, kind of, and then Vision, right? Uh, and then Black Widow has been screaming out for, uh, you know, more screen time. Even Falcon, and Falcon has a, obviously a cameo in the Ant-Man film, but wouldn't it be great if he got more, even more screen time than that? Uh, I just, you know, and then Marvel has Black Panther coming up, Captain Marvel, the whole, all the Inhumans. They still really have to introduce Thanos, which they haven't done appropriately. Sif got the short end of the stick. Uh, you know, Jamie Alexander keeps saying, oh, the next movie, I'm gonna get more development, but we have yet to see it. And I just think that they should, you know, really just pick a couple of characters and do a great job developing them. I think that, you know, having so many characters is a little bit of the negative side of fan service, because because while we get excited to see our favorite characters, you know, live action versions of them, uh, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a, a letdown and anticlimactic and also, uh, I mean, even so far as going as uh, detrimental to the franchise when you get cheated, right? Like think of Emma Frost. Everyone was like, oh, I'm so happy to see Emma Frost finally. But then they, they went, they jumped the gun. They cast, uh, uh, you know, January Jones in the role. She wasn't up to the task. The character had very little to do in uh, X-Men First Class and that ended up being killed by the franchise off camera, no less. So you take a huge fan favorite character and you basically just waste her. So I, I think that they shouldn't try and run through these characters like tissues, like Kleenex, they should instead uh, really take their time and only bring them on board when they're fully ready to and, and, the, and there's space for them. So I think this is a problem for both DC and Marvel and anybody making comic book movies or even genre movies right now, especially as they do spin-offs uh, and the like. And so we'll see what happens if we really do get to a breaking point. And then don't even get me started. All the video game characters are going to start being introduced shortly. Uh, it is going to be very hard indeed for uh, mainstream audiences to keep up, especially because they're not used to having to do so because they don't read this kind of material. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.